Yeah. All right, good morning and welcome back to Twin Stick Garage. On today's episode, I'm gonna get working on the Bandit Trans Am. Now, in order to do that, I gotta get the Bandit Kenworth truck out of the way here so I can actually have some room to work. But man, am I ever excited to try and get this car on the road by summer. There, that's not too bad. You can see all my heat and diesel exhaust leaving the nice warm shop. But luckily it hasn't been too cold out here considering that cold snap that we've had recently. It's only about minus five or something. It's kind of pretty mild for, for us Canadians, but I'll let it air out of touch more. I guess while I'm doing that, I'll give you a quick update on what's going on on my other projects. So of course the Iron Duke cab over, uh, I had some interesting ideas recently uh, one of which was to consider putting uh, bubble windows in the back corner of the cab now i'm actually going to pivot away from that primarily because one of the viewers made the point and said hey mark i had these in my uh, in my van back in the day and what can happen when you have your driving down the highway and both the driver and passenger door windows are open is air blows in and it pressurizes the cab and if you've got vintage bubble windows it could potentially crack them or blow them out and I just I don't want to deal with that so no more bubble windows and then the other the other great idea I had was to chop the top and set it down and I was I was seriously considering it, it wasn't uh, I wasn't trolling but what ended up pivoting me away from that was again another another smart viewer said hey Mark you haven't lived till you've actually climbed up into your Kenworth cab over and cracked your head on the uh, on the opening there because you don't always remember to duck and that's not a good time when you when you do that and I thought if I lower if I lower this thing down I'm going to actually crack my head even more trying to crawl through a little door so no more no more bubble windows no more <laughs> chopping the top going to leave it as it is and uh, and just keep progressing forward but just to give an update on the back end I've been working on the uh, trying to reassemble everything back here I've, uh, I've got the cross members in. Of course, I got the disc from the gear center, got the little short drive shaft. I've got to actually head over to Pat's drive line and get a custom longer drive shaft built. Um, so that's coming up in a future project or future episode. I've got to put the fifth wheel plate back on, brakes, drums, seals, do all that. And then my plan is to actually take these steel wheels, flip them around, put them on the inside. And then I've got polished wheels like on the peat for the outside. And once once the back end's all put back together with the inners and the outers, then Blake and I can start working on those, setting up those tub fenders, those fiberglass tub fenders that I actually got from the Big Rig Chrome Shop. So that's gonna be coming in a future episode. We're gonna mount that with some wicked light bars front and back and yeah, just a lot of work that still needs doing. I gotta put the interior in. I got that awesome red and white button tuft or button tuck, however you wanna say it. Interior from the day cab company. And now that the interior is all painted, I can go ahead and get that installed, which is gonna just be awesome. Still got some body work to do on that. Gotta get the dash in. So there's still a lot of work that he's doing on the Duke. If you wanna see more of the episodes on that, go check out my Patreon. And then on the Pete, of course, if you've been following the last few episodes, I've done the, uh, completed the big hole conversion 
front and back that's all complete now the cab corners are in blake and i still have some work to do on closing up these holes and then i actually reached out to truck shrouds and they've got door skins and buck bolts so these aren't huck bolts these are there's no collar there they're just like a rivet that gets crushed and they're called buck bolts instead of huck and so they're going to send me some door skins so i can replace all of these and because i just i couldn't live my ocd got the better of me when i was looking at these nice profiled huck bolts and then saw these ones that had just been sanded down multiple times through the years so i'm going to redo the door skins and hopefully get lbl ready for paint by the springtime but man there is just a ton of projects that i'm doing with these trucks and <laughs> keeps me busy on my saturdays right Gives you guys lots of content to watch but as i mentioned today i want to work on the trans am now that i got the truck out of the way if you recall when i pulled the little anemic 301 engine out of the out of the car i left the transmission in place and it was very nice of vivor to send me a transmission jack so i'm going to set that up and then lower that down out of there the drive shaft out of here the exhaust like I always say, just start picking away and see how far I get. I want to do some cleanup underneath here and eventually i uh, got some undercoating that I want to put on there. And yeah, I just, uh, like I say, start going on my Saturday and see how far I get and turn it into an episode and that's what you're watching right now. So let's get at it. One transmission jack. Man, that thing was like putting together a piece of IKEA furniture. The instructions weren't really that clear. They give you one little drawing. So I had to actually look at the picture on Amazon, but it seems like a solid, seems like a solid jack and it should work really well. And the reason I wanted it was not just to drop the transmission out of this car, but if I ever do other cars, I've got the flexibility now to put transmissions in and out. So I guess that's as high as it goes. So I'm gonna have to lower my wildfire lift to actually set the transmission on it. But that, that just still work. I'll just have to, to duck to get underneath. Okay, so now I guess I'll remove the temporary strapping that I had here. Well, I wonder, I should probably take the torque converter out of there just because I know it's inevitably gonna fall off. Uh, oh, oh, first oil leak of the day. Oh, beauty Clark. That's okay, automatic transmission fluid cleans, doesn't it? It's a cleaning agent, so it'll make my floor cleaner. So one transmission out of the car, wasn't too, too bad. Uh, what did old twin sticks learn? A couple of things. First of which is it's probably advisable to drain the old fluid out of the pan. Now I knew there was oil in there, but there's no drain plug on automatic transmissions, at least not on these old ones. And you actually have to take all the bolts off and lower the pan and it just, it goes everywhere. So I purposely left it in there. I knew it would, uh, would kind of drain out of the back cone here when it was tilted. But that is one thing that I learned as well is I wasn't using, I didn't actually have this set up correctly. So you see how I slid the tray in underneath the pan? I actually got it wrong. It should have been this way with the transmission going out because that way I could have used this to adjust. So when I had all that oil draining out of there, I could have adjusted it up and tilted it up so it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't drain the oil. And so when I put a new transmission back in, I'll know that it goes this way. And the other one was, I guess when you're, when you're taking it out of there, it probably would have been advisable to take the drive shaft off first. I mean, luckily the emergency brake cable was there, so I was able to support the drive shaft. But uh, if I do it again, I take the drive shaft off first. But that wasn't too bad. And now, this transmission's ready to roll. 
onto the garbage dump. <laughs> well, this obviously was a one, so this is a three speed Pontiac transmission. You could tell by the, I think it's a TM350 if I'm not mistaken. And the reason you could tell it's a Pontiac is it's got this dished part on the front there. So of course I had a transmission that came with the 400 engine that's over there. And I'll probably use that one. Uh, I'm gonna send that off to the gear center, but I will keep this as an uh, you know, emergency backup. And uh, what am I gonna do with that 301? I was thinking I could take it to the scrapyard, but then I thought, you know what? Why don't I give it to someone that's actually going to get some use out of it? So my daughter, as I mentioned in earlier episodes, is in high school and she's in her uh, mechanics, going into mechanics 30 next year. So what I might do is wheel that 301 over there and then let the, uh, let the, the kids there learn how to take engines apart and put them back together on, on that old engine. But I might keep it until I get the 400 back in the car, just in case there's some bracketry for the uh, pulleys that I need to, to do. But maybe I'll, I'll donate this and that old 301 to the, to the high school mechanics class. I think that's a good idea. All right, so I was just underneath here, observing and, uh, and dreaming a little. So if you've noticed that the front of this car is what's this, this is all called a subframe, right? And it's held in here with, I believe four bolts. So we got one here, one there, of course that bushing shot. And then maybe there's, maybe there's two here. So there's six bolts. And a guy could lift the body up and then wheel this whole mess right out uh, and separate it from the car. So that might be something I do. And then I was, I was actually digging around on the interwebs recently and there's a company called Detroit Speed and Engineering and they actually manufacture brand new front ends, subframes for these cars. They're all welded up, powder coated black, They've got modern suspension, brand new disc brakes, and I could basically just wheel out the old and wheel in the new and bolt it into place. So I am seriously considering getting one of those because man, that would sure freshen up the front end. So we'll see, we'll see. I'm, I'm still trying to, uh, to figure out where I'm gonna find the pennies to, to afford that, but I might do that. Worst case, I'll rebuild the old one. I was, uh, my buddy Danny there at DD Speed Shop, He's redoing an old Camaro right now, and he took this subframe out on his Camaro, and the holes uh, here in the subframe uh, rails were actually so worn that the, the body could move, which means this whole front end could move around slightly back and forth. So you could never get a good alignment, and it's, of course, not safe to have this thing moving against the body. So he actually welded new plates on there and that have new holes and then just put the put it back in the car. So I thought that was pretty slick. So worst case, I'll at least do that. So I should probably start looking at getting these bolts out of here. And then no matter, well, that was the other thing that uh, Danny was talking about. He was saying, because his was a 67 and the welds, like these are factory welds. Look at this, look at this garbage. He was saying his was probably welded by like some 18 year old kid at the factory in on a Friday afternoon, but I mean, those are like twin stick wells. That's just junk. <laughs> but that's all they really cared about back then. Just fold it over and close it up and shove it under the car. But I'm, I'm really quite surprised that that's not, that's not done a little better in the late seventies. But, and then I was looking at the fenders. So of course the fenders are held in by these. Well, I guess there's supposed to be a bolt back there that's missing. And then this washer is supposed to be on the outside. And then on this side here, it's not even, it's not even lined up. This slot's supposed to be through there. So that's probably got a lot to do with why I'm not, I'm got, I've got pretty horrible oof, gaps between my fender and my door. So that's gonna need to be fixed. Oh man, there's just so much to work on, but I guess I'll pick something and, uh, and get rolling here. So I'm gonna take the drive shaft out. I'm gonna take the exhaust out of here as well. And then I might drop this crusty old fuel tank and because uh, it's got a big dent in it and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty rotten and I can get a new one as well. So I think that's what I'll do now. It's just, it can be these, even though it's small, it's small stuff. Like it's look, at the, look at this cute little U-joint. It's small, but it's still, it's almost as many things as a big truck because you still got to tackle the exhaust and the suspension and the bodywork and all that. So it's just, it's smaller, but it's still a lot of work and it can be somewhat overwhelming, but I guess I'm just gonna pick something and keep trying to push my way forward here because uh, any progress is progress, right?
gonna try out what's left of my my needle scaler. So this thing has done a lot of damage. It uh, I've worked on it. I've used it on the Iron Duke frame, and I've used it uh, a ton on the tandems that were underneath the Snowman trailer. So most of the needles are missing now. All the the studs that hold it in place are broken off, so I can't even twist it on tight. So I'm gonna have to go back to Prince Auto and get a new one of these. But I just thought I'd try it and see how it cleans up all this rust and scale. Yeah, it's just not, it's not working like it was when it was brand new. So like I say, I'll head off to Princess and get a new one and maybe that's what I'll tackle in the next episode is getting all that rust and scale off of there. Bummer, would have been nice to get that done. Man, isn't global warming nice? It's above zero now. The uh, snow is melting off the roof. It's crazy. So I figured I'd let the, I'd let some of the warm Alberta air into the shop. Okay, let's get to work, Mark. All right, so I can't remember if I actually filled this thing up I think I did before, uh, before my last drive in the fall. So rather than undo the straps and have, I don't know, 20 gallons of gas fall on me, I figure maybe best to try and, uh, maybe I'll lower the car down and siphon, siphon the gas out of there first before I start monkeying with it. I was just trying to tap the, the edges smooth because obviously the previous owner did some some patch repairs. But now that the exhaust is out of here, check this out. Oh boy. Yeah, that's gonna need a little work. Mud, rust, bondo. Hmm. Yeah. Might have to get my buddy Blake to help me weld in some new steel there. Although, is that the, is that the, is the inner? Is that the light? I don't know, what is this? Holy cow, is this the original build sheet? Oh, no, something Napa. What is this? No, just a uh, antifreeze. <laughs> How'd that get in there? Oh, what is this filler crap that they put in there? So many years of, of previous owners. Looks like some kind of bondo filler. Oh man. Well, I wonder if I can get... Yeah, that's why it was going thud. This is just filled with bondo. I mean, this is pretty common to rust out. Think of this car's, you know, 50, well, 40, 45 years old and the road spray, if it was driven in the wintertime in Alberta, they salt the roads up here and the salt and sand just gets caught up in behind there and just rots it out. So I'm not surprised that that's a little, little rotten. How's the other side look? Yeah, not as bad. Here's my hammer. Yeah, more solid, I guess. All right. Well, that side's definitely going to require a little bit of a little bit of cutting and welding for sure. So this is how we used to steal, I mean borrow gas, back in the day from a buddy's car. Otto, why don't you get some more gas? Here's the credit card. Ooh. And the mint for afterwards. There it goes. Ha, <laughs> the art of siphoning. Well, I don't want to let this gas go to waste, so I'll put it in my daughter's Mustang. <laughs> All right, so while that's draining, I guess... Oh, yeah, so a lot of people, they don't, they're not fans of the... So this is, uh, this, these would have been the 79 to 81, I believe, taillights. A little more modern, kind of Knight Rider-ish look. And they definitely don't match the ones on the Smoking the Bandit 
76 Trans Am, which was actually became the 77 Trans Am when the movie was released. So I may swap these out. I don't know how easy it is to do, but if I could actually find, it's not my first priority, but if I could actually find someone selling a set of the 77 taillights, I probably would try and take these out of here and figure out a way to, to get those in there. There it goes. Oh, so that's gonna need to be painted too. And a little bit of rust. Oh, what do we got back here? More seat covers in red velour. Gorgeous. Oh, nasty. Yeah, we won't be needing those. Oh, look what we got here. We've got our rear sway bar. All right. Oh, well, there's some black ones. Of course, that's black cloth, not black leather or vinyl like I need. Yeah, and they're pretty ugly. Just looking at these, it looks like they're just plastic wing nuts to hold the, the tail lights in. And there's only two of them, there's two missing. Is that how easy these tail lights are to replace? Let's just take a little test here. Uh oh, uh -oh. now did I screw that up? Oh. Ha! Look at that! It's as simple as that to take those out of there. Okay, well, I guess, now the question is gonna be, is did they keep, did they keep this same one, two, three, four, five, five stud setup for the 77? And then when they went to the different one in 78, 79, 80, or no, 79, 80, 81. Um, I'd be curious if anyone knows, if the 77 style of the Trans Am, Bandit Trans Am, has the same five studs. Because if they do, then I can start looking for those lights and it would be simple. All I have to do is just slide it in place and put those little wing nuts in there. Oh, that's cool. So I got, I got distracted with my treasure hunting in the trunk and ended up overflowing because I wasn't watching my jug and ended up spilling a little bit. That's no big deal. You don't need to worry about a little bit of gas. Just cleans the floor, right? Uh, where's my mint? <laughs> Damn, I shouldn't have eaten the mint first. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of surface rust, but it, things seem decently solid in here. So I think what I might do, I'm just gonna try it out and see this how this stuff works. This is rust check, high build stone shield. So I figure something like this, I'll obviously clean this all out and wire wheel it, but I just, like I said, I don't want to see how it works. Oh yeah, that's gonna be beautiful stuff. When I finally get to doing that. So I was thinking of using this stuff, obviously in the trunk here as well, but then underneath the car. Cause I think, again, once I, um, uh, needle scale all the rust off of there. I'm just gonna spray, I bought about six cans of this and I'm just gonna spray this everywhere and it's just gonna put that nice kind of rock guard look on there. That should be a nice finish, easy peasy. Actually, why don't I do that now? That'll be a quick easy job. second coat after this packs up a bit but man this is like undercoating in a can I really like this stuff and it's got that nice textured finish just perfect for a trunk or underneath a vehicle I can't wait to do the whole underside of the car in this stuff all right so I just finished up a second coat and man does it ever look uniform now isn't that nice Man, I'm really impressed with that stuff. Tell you what, looks like it came from the factory. 
All right, last project of the day. I'm gonna try and get that fuel tank out of there because that was my goal. And now that I got 10 gallons of fuel out of it, it should, uh, should be a little lighter. was fun. Huh. Oh, I ate 40 years of dirt. Huh. I think I've got something I can wash that down with though. So my goal is I'm going to switch this car from carburation to, uh, to fuel injection and I'm looking at the Holly systems and so my plan is going to be is get a new Holly. I'm thinking sniper. See if I can afford that. But the Holly um, Sniper system, you can actually get a new tank, a brand new aluminum tank, and then it's got all the senders and then it's got all the fuel lines to, to send it all the way up to the, uh, to the new fuel injected replacement unit instead of a carburetor. So I'm definitely gonna go with that. Uh, the other thing that I've been noticing when I'm looking online with these old Trans Ams is, oh, ah, still, still chewing dirt. Um, is that they have this what's called a silencing kit which is basically just rubber strips that go over top of this to replace these thin kind of paper cheapy ones and what that helps to do is to keep is to isolate it because this is where those strips go you can see where it tore off and then as these wear through the tank starts rubbing there and squeaking as you're going down the road so I'll definitely put the anti-squeak straps in as well but no that's good I'm Definitely happy that I am grateful that I pulled the 10 gallons of gas out of here because this thing would have came down with a hell of a lot more force <laughs> if I hadn't siphoned it all out of there. Well, now that that's out of there, I can clean this all up. Oh, sounds like an earthquake. <laughs> that's the snow coming off the backside. And that's why I didn't put the parts Trans Am near. Actually, I'll go out there later and show you what I'm talking about. But I didn't put the parts Trans Am near the shop because as the snow came thundering off of there it would have just crushed the car okay where was i uh yeah clean this all up and then i'll put that stone shield spray all over on here and that'll be good now i have good access as well to get these hangers out of here and get new bushings yeah we're gonna have to do something with this i might what the hell Oh man, that's some, what, what did he use? Some kind of, well, it looks like fiberglass, Canadian tire fiberglass, <laughs> same stuff I use, but didn't mix it very well. Yeah, that's just junk. But other than that, I don't see any, any kind of Bondo fixes on this car. The rest seems pretty solid. I mean, this is a little beat up, but again, I can clean that up and, uh, and spray that stuff on there. So. Cool. Well, let me go show you what's kind of doing back in the back 40 with the uh, snowman trailer. I guess it's nearing the end of the day here. I better, I better give snowman a little start and warm it up. Not that it got that cold, but it needs to air up anyway. Oh, oil. Oh, listen to that low. Love this truck. Okay, so as I mentioned, I don't know if I've ever shown it, I wrapped the snowman trailer for winter. So I wanted to make sure, well, maybe I'll go through on this side. I was trying to protect, I was trying to obviously protect the sticker. And the worst thing you can do is when you tarp something is the wind blows and slaps the tarp against the, and rubs the trailer. So. That's why I tried to rope it off. I tried to get it as tight as I could, stitching it underneath. And then I ran a strap around the side. So I've come out here on a ridiculously windy day and I don't see it moving. So hopefully it's good. I guess we're gonna find out in another couple months when I take everything off of here. But I did get it pretty tight. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's gonna be good. And then this is the parts car. So this is another 1980 Trans Am. Uh, well, no, it's a Firebird. It's not a Trans Am, it's a formula. And obviously got it tarped up for the winter. But it's gonna be my 
parts car. So if there's anything I might need on there to steal. Oh, I got Firebird. I wonder, wonder if the, if this side is in better shape. No, it'd be this side. Actually, it looks, it looks decent. So what we could do is cut that out of there and then get Blake to, to help me stitch that in and then just do some body work. So I, I might steal that corner uh, and then whatever else I might need. But yeah, hopefully. <laughs> oh, and yeah, this is what I was talking about. So the snow, when it builds up, it kind of comes sliding off that roof there in the spring. As you can see, there's no more snow and it all comes thundering off. Now that's like 16 feet high. So when it drops, it's got a lot of force and I guess I should have moved my trailer over thundered onto my trailer but trailers can take it i don't think 1980 formula firebirds could though so that's why i wheeled that over there but yeah all right snowman trailer we'll see you in a few months all right so top down a while ago sent me this battery tester and i've been meaning to try it out because i've been having a little trouble with the snowman batteries recently You'll know in the last episode when I put that Vivor diesel heater in the truck, I, I didn't have enough power to actually run the diesel heater. So I swapped out the first and third batteries with the two that I had for the Iron Duke. And I was able to start the truck and of course I got the, the heater going. But I thought this is probably a good opportunity to double check and use this tester to check the health of the batteries and the health of the charging system. So I guess with that, I'm gonna just put this on like that, like that. Let's see how this thing works here. I was just reading the instructions to try and figure it out. So battery test, regular flooded, cold cranking, yeah. Testing, it says good, 100% health, 63% charge. So healthy battery, but a little low on the juice. So that one needs a charge, but it's good to know that it's healthy. I actually um, recently with that ridiculous minus 40 temperature we or the weather we had, I had uh, the batteries in both my daughter's vehicles froze up and once they freeze they just won't take a charge. Oh this one's good, look at that. Good battery, 100% health, 73% charge. Uh, once batteries freeze they just don't seem to hold a charge anymore so I ended up going off to Canadian Tire and buying new batteries and every other dad in the town was picking up batteries as well. I think that just minus 40, minus 50 temperature was, was just too much for a lot of the batteries out there. So they've got new batteries in their vehicles. Okay, health is good, only 36%. So this one's even lower. And we'll just check the last one here. Good, 100% health. Okay, so all these batteries, they're all pretty recent or uh, recently purchased within a year. So I expect them to all be in good health. It's just they're a little low on the juice. Okay, there's a couple more tricks this thing can do. So next up, I want to do the uh, cranking test. So cranking test, please start engine. Okay, so cranking is low. Cranking time, 664 milliseconds. So it, uh, it was struggling a little. I mean, obviously it cranked it over, the engine's warm, but I suspect that's a function of the fact that three out of the four batteries, they're in good health but they're uh, you know low charge so I should be able to fix that up just with a charge and then I guess the last one here is a charging test please start engine okay so charging is normal 12.2 loaded 14 volts unloaded so it's happy with that <laughs> look at that it even prints out a test report so snowman you got a clean bill of health your electrical system is intact just need to charge your batteries. Okay, so thanks a lot Top Don for sending me that. If you want to get one of these battery testers as well, just go check them out, topdon.com. I've got a link down in the description below. All right, I think I've earned my treat. I wonder how much beer's left in this thing. Oh yeah, there's, there's a little bit left in there. I probably got another month or two of episodes left to drink. Oh. That washes down the dirt nicely. Ah, so thanks. Thanks again for watching all the way to the end. I appreciate if you 
if you want to leave a comment, good, bad, or otherwise. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you learned something. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and do that. And yeah, hope to see you next week. And don't ever forget, if you got it, the trucker brought it.